and our second speaker, Maria Ayala, a PhD student at the Center of Vision of York University, led by Dennis Enriquez. And she's going to show us how efferent and afferent estimates of end location do not optimally integrate. Very curious to see your results, Mariah. Please take it away. Awesome. Uh, thanks for the intro. So today, like uh, what Valentina said, we'll be presenting. I'll be presenting on efferent and afferent estimates and how they don't, uh, we saw that they don't optimally integrate. Uh, so our central nervous system can rely on at least two sources of information in order to localize the limb position in the absence of vision. So first we have our proprioceptive afferents from receptors in our limbs. And we also have an efferent copy of the motor command uh, used by the cerebellum to generate a prediction of sensory consequences. To produce a reliable single estimate about the location of the limb, these two sources of information could be optimally integrated using Bayesian integration or maximum likelihood estimation. And while some work has been done to investigate whether the CNS optimally combines vision and proprioceptive cues, less is known for the integration of non-sensory signals uh, for limb estimates such as these efferent signals, um, given the difficulty of isolating them from the ever-present proprioceptive afferent signals. So here we use our new paradigm to isolate efferent-based estimates of hand position from proprioception, and we had over 220 healthy participants, both younger and older adults over the age of 55, um, and we had them localize their hand after actively reaching in a self-chosen direction, and we call this our active localization condition, or after being passively moved by a robotic manipulandum, and we call this our passive localization condition. So here's our experimental setup. We had participants uh, localized their unseen right hand using their seen left hand, um, and they viewed along this horizontal plane. Uh, we had participants do this, uh, localize their, their limb along this arc right here, as you can see on the bottom right panel. We had them do these active, uh, active localization uh, conditions after reaching with an aligned cursor, and we also had them do that after training with a perturbed cursor. So our first question, was whether uh, estimates of hand location based on both efferent and afferent signals, so that's our active localization condition, are more precise than those based only on proprioceptive information. So that's our passive localization condition. According to the Emily rule or other straightforward Bayesian mechanisms, uh, variance should be lower in the condition, in the localization condition where the two signals are combined. So that's our x-axis here, the active localization condition. And it should be higher when you only have a single source of information, which is our passive localization that only has proprioception. Uh, but we found no evidence in support of this. So here you'll see uh, variance in passive localization over variance in active localization. And although there are some younger cohort members who could be showing optimal integration, you'll see in the light orange colors, um, the majority of them sort of just fall along this identity line. When we look at our older participants, there are some that do show that, but they, again, um, more or less fall along the um, identity line, which suggests to us that one or two signals are about equally reliable. Our second question is whether older adults display greater proprioceptive variability than younger adults. Um, here you'll see the probability density function for the active localization condition and the passive localization conditions. And in the warmer hues, you'll see the younger participants and the uh, older participants in the cooler hues. The dashed lines represent the variances for each localization condition. And as you can see, there seems to not be an effect of age on reliability of localization. In our final question, we looked at whether weaker proprioceptive uh, priors led to greater learning-induced shifts in hand localization, as would be predicted by Bayesian inference. Uh, so here on the X, you'll see, uh, sorry, on the Y, you'll see post-training localization shifts over pre-training localization variances. So here on, you'll see active localization variability and on uh, the side, the passive localization variability. Um, and as you can see, we don't see a relationship. Um, it's also something that we see with our older participants. Um, uh, and as you can see, we don't find that noisier, highly variable estimates were more susceptible to larger proprioceptive recalibration following adaptation to a perturbation. And this suggests to us uh, that Bayesian explanations um, about integration 
of uh, afferent and efferent signals are not as likely here. Uh, so uh, together, these findings make it less likely that the CNS combines efferent-based predicted sensory consequences and proprioceptive afferents optimally, uh, at least when estimating the final limb position. Right, so that's the end of it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to fill the time that people take to type down their questions, uh, asking you for a clarification on your groups, the younger and older. Uh, what, what's your, what the age range we're talking about and whether you have tried a more continuous effect of age instead of binarizing? Uh, so we haven't done that. This, uh, our younger participants are between the age of 18 to 35. Older are around 55 to uh, seven, like around mid 70s. Okay, so yeah, coming from dementia research, I still call them like <laughs> adults. <laughs> Older <laughs> adults, <laughs> they're, not, <laughs> they're not that old for me, but uh, but yeah, it, it makes sense. And so yeah, you said you ha you haven't tried a more continuous um, age effect, possible no. correlation mm -hmm. with. Um, but yeah, I agree that it doesn't seem to be there looking at the, mm -hmm. at the graph. Um, if any of the other speakers want to unmute and ask questions, just motion me, yeah? don't, uh, don't, don't be shy. Um, I was also wondering how you, because um, I know these presentations are so fast, if you could elaborate a bit more on the motor area variability and whether that could explain the variability that you see in localization. Okay, so I've got a slide for this, just in case. <laughs> um, right, so, uh, so here you'll see on the X is motor air variability. So just variability um, of uh, baseline reaches. Um, and on the Y you'll see localization variability. And we don't see a relationship or um, either passive localization or the active localization condition. So um, motor noise doesn't seem to explain um, localization variability. Um, what are you planning on doing next? So if we're not using <laughs> by <Bayesian, laughs> what are we doing to establish uh, <laughs> how to move our hands? <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's unclear, but keep, uh, please follow or us on Twitter and you'll see like our next uh, our next publications on this. You're planning on using uh, the same uh, setting but with other populations as we were mentioning in the previous talk or to tweak your paradigm to dive more into possible explanations along with the effect. Um, yeah, I don't think like, we, oh, sorry. I'm just gonna stop sharing. No problem, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think we have plans to look into um, like more like uh, specific populations. Um, yeah. But maybe you can make like the task harder or change the, the paradigm. Possibly, yeah. Um, 